Hi everyone, welcome to the Triassens Martial Arts Channel, another episode of Fact or Fiction. Now if you have been following my previous episode of Fact or Fiction where I discussed the origin of Quan Fa, aka Chinese traditional martial art, uh, you will know that um, that video's content has upset some people, namely David Ross, who was a self-imposed expert on Chinese language, history, and etc etc. And I've already addressed uh, all his you know, argument and see how childish and incorrect he was. Um, but over here I'd like to quickly mention one more thing. So one of his major accusations towards me was the incorrect usage of the word P in a Chinese martial arts system called P Gua Quan. Right, so just to refresh your memory, I use this character P. Well he insists that another character, this character P is the correct one. And now in my last video, I've already gone through the concept of Tong Jia Zi, right? Where two characters of, of same or similar sound in the Chinese language can be used in each other's place. But just in case, you know, some of you are not completely convinced, I've managed to dig up the historical precedent of this character P. So this character that I use, that you can see here, currently, it mostly means to wear or to put something onto your back and shoulder. For example, when you put a cape on your shoulder, that's called pido peng. And when you put on your armor, back in the day when you go to war, it's called pi jia. However, the other pi, right, the one that he insists is the correct one for pi gua. Now take note that, as I've always said, there are no correct and incorrect, both are correct. It's just that this newer character is used more predominantly today. But if you were were to go back to the early Qing Dynasty, then both characters are correct. And in fact, in the early days of PY system, the character I used was the one that they used back in the days. So this new character, it means to chop or to split. Usually referring to with weaponry such an, as an axe. For example, Pi Chai when you're splitting a log for, for firewood. So naturally, within this modern context, these two characters no longer share the same meaning, and therefore uh, P Gua decided to go with the, this P because it means to chop and in P Gua there's a lot of chopping motion and that is perfectly fine. However, as I said, historically this is not the case. In fact, if you were to look up one of the most famous historical texts or historical record called Shi Ji, right, which literally translates to historical record written by a very famous scholar called Sima Qian. So in his writing of Shi Ji, under the chapter Wu Di Ben Ji, the record of the five emperor, under the section about Huang Di, the yellow emperor, there is a sentence that reads Pi Shan Tong Dao Wei Chang Ning Ju. Right over here, P is clearly written as the P that I used, but it refers to Pi Shan Tong Dao, meaning splitting open the mountain to clear a path. So from here we can see that clearly back in that time, Splitting or chopping is still using this P and not that other P which was invented at a later stage. One misconception is that you know these are misspelling, right? Like we have in English, but that's not the case because clearly Sima Qian is one of the most credentialed scholars of his time. He's not uneducated. Right? Spelling error usually comes from people that are uneducated, which Sima Qian clearly is not. So this isn't a spelling error, which is why in Chinese we don't call it a spelling error, we call it, spelling error in Chinese we call it 错别字, instead it's called 通假字. What it means is that this character was the legitimate character to use at that time for P. Well, we don't know exactly when this newer P was invented, but clearly that it was invented at a later stage, so that this original P can focus on its one meaning instead of carrying multiple meanings, which makes it even harder to determine what these ancient texts are saying. So if you look at the historical development of Chinese language and texts, you will see that the further you go in history, the less actual characters there are. Often one character has multiple different meanings, but as you know, the language develops more and more, we add more characters for each specific meaning, and eventually this newer P was founded. Anyway, so this piece is just to let you know that I'm not speaking out of my ass. Right? There are historical precedents to using this P instead of that other P. 
Alright, enough of that, let's get on to today's main topic, which is yet another can of worms that I have been planning to open for quite some time. And undoubtedly this content will probably upset a lot of people again, uh, especially people like David Ross who pretend to know everything there is to know about Chinese martial art and culture. And this topic is basically going to discuss whether or not Chinese shui jiao or Chinese wrestling is part of the Chinese traditional martial art systems. And throughout my years of interacting with the Western Chinese martial art community, I've come to realize that a lot of the people in the West tend to think that shui jiao is actually considered a traditional Chinese martial art system. It's part of the, the, the same classification. And that's actually not the case for anyone coming out of the actual you know, mainland China. Which is why I thought it's quite important to clarify this topic. But before we go into it, I would just like to clarify that this has nothing to do with whether or not Chinese wrestling is useful or practical. Right? Chinese wrestling in itself is a very practical set of skills that should anyone is interested, I would definitely recommend you to learn it. So this isn't about any practicality of these practices. Instead, this is a purely a study of cultural and social study. We're going to look at how these two groups, right, Chinese martial art aka Quanfa, which we've, we've defined in my last video, versus Chinese shui jiao or Chinese wrestling, and see how they're actually not the same thing. And in China, we don't classify them as the same system. Now, when asked the question of, you know, is Chinese shui jiao part of Chinese traditional martial arts, there are two things that are very important. First of all, is the context. Second of all, is the period. So what do I mean by context? Well, basically, what do you define as Chinese traditional martial art? If by this definition, you are referring to any combat practice that's coming out of the piece of land geographically known as China, uh, then yes, Chinese shui jiao is a form of martial art that came out of a piece of land called China. However, as we've mentioned in the last video, if Chinese traditional martial art is a translation of wushu, or further in the back in the day is quan fa or quan shu, if that is the meaning of Chinese traditional martial art, then shui jiao is actually not part of Chinese traditional martial art. So this is about its context. Then we need to look at the period. Depending on which period are you asking, in different periods, there are different interpretations and classifications for Chinese traditional martial art. In order to understand the period better, we're going to basically take a chronological tour quickly from back in the days till present day. So wrestling, right? not just Chinese wrestling, but any wrestling, is pretty much the oldest form of hand-to-hand -hand combat from any ancient civilization. Right? We have records of Greek people doing this, of Romans doing this, quite possibly of Mesopotamians doing this, and of course, undoubtedly, Chinese people have been doing this at least as far as spring-autumn period, if not further, right? There are legend of, you know, Yellow Emperor's opposition, um, Chi Yu, having skillful wrestlers in his uh, tribe. But obviously, those are legends that were written, you know, a thousand years after where it's supposed to take place, and that obviously is not very credible in terms of history. But from actual research and record, we can pretty much be certain that at least during the spring autumn period, China has already started wrestling. Now, why is wrestling the oldest form of hand-to-hand -hand combat? Is it because, you know, it's the best form of it? That's debatable. However, it is the most instinctive way people fight. So what that means is if you take two kids who have no training whatsoever and you watch them fight, they might throw a few slaps here and there. But right after that, they will close in the gap and they will start to wrestle. That is the most common way that comes instinctively without us having to think we are born to be able to wrestle. There are two adults, you know, they will basically do the same. Of course, in modern day, it's different because everyone is watching boxing matches, MMA, karate. So they already have a preconception of throwing punches and controlling distance and whatnot. But before combat sports has been popularized by media, uh, back in the days when adults, untrained adults, right, when they get engaged into a fight, which I still see from time to time when I visit China, right, when people fight over a seat in a bus or in a train or on the street, you know, they're more 
most likely go into a wrestling range after throwing some unsuccessful slap to each other. And furthermore, if we look into the animal kingdom, we'll see that, you know, excluding the animals that cannot lift their front limb, such as, you know, bugs, horses, zebras, hippopotamus, all of those, the animals that can actually balance temporarily on their, on their rear limbs and, you know, lift up their front limb, they don't strike each other as much as wrestle, right? If you look at lions fighting, tigers fighting, they might like throw one, two slap, but right after that, they'll catch on each other and they'll start trying to wrestle. And usually the one who wrestles the other ones on top is the winner of that contest. So from this, we can see that wrestling is the most basic, instinctive form of combat, which is why in every civilization, if humans decided to engage in empty hand combat, wrestling is the first thing that comes to mind. Striking, on the other hand, requires a lot more counterintuitive practice, controlling distance, stepping back, controlling range, throwing punches in different angles, which is why it requires a lot more work, a lot more study, which is why it evolved at a later stage. I'm not saying that striking is definitely better than wrestling or wrestling better than striking. This is just purely a historical observation of why every civilization starts off with wrestling. And as I've mentioned, in China, from what we know at the moment, uh, wrestling at least started in the spring-autumn period. And during that period, while wrestling has many names throughout Chinese history, during that period, the predominant name used is called Jiao Di. Now, of course, I can actually skip this whole naming part, but, you know, considering that the uh, nut-picking assholes are David Ross out there, you know, trying to pick on everything that I don't mention, so let's just, you know, go real academic and go through all the different names. Uh, just bear with me if you're not actually interested. We'll get over this as quick as possible. So the original name that we can know from record is called Jiao Di. Jiao is a character that means Hong. It's one of the most ancient characters we can find from the Chinese Bon Oracle manuscript. Jiao basically means Hong from any animal such as an ox, a bull, etc. Uh, later on, this character then also can be interpreted as having a conflict because animals with horns, such as bugs, uh, deer, and, you know, rhino, or the you know, have them in China, uh, bull, ox, when they get into conflict, they butt their, their horn against each other, right? They, they head butt each other, and they fight with the horns. So that's how the Chinese people, according to scholars that study this topic, derive from horn being considered as a contest, because that's what horn animals do. So what this character means, horn, originally, it can also be interpreted as having a conflict. The second character, Di, means to repel or to resist. And back in those days, it referred to repel and, and resist with strings, and usually with open palm. So that's basically another very close description of what wrestling was back in the days. We can see that from the kind of painting that they, that they uncovered from the Han Dynasty, that when they wrestled, they basically almost like they put their hand against each other and then they try to see who is stronger. So adding these two together, basically it is a contest of strings and of resistance. So that's the original meaning of Jiao Di, and that's Chinese wrestling. Another name that they use around that time is called Jiao Li. Again, Jiao is Hong, which means contest, and Li means strings. So you can see that at that time, the primitive way of wrestling is less about technical skill, what we can see today in Chinese wrestling or in judo, etc. It's more about raw strength to see who is stronger. And this form of wrestling has been practiced in the military of various kingdoms around Spring Autumn, Warring State, all the way to the Han Dynasty. But what's interesting is that it is also considered as a spectator sport. The kings and royalties would once in a while gather people to have a contest where they would watch and possibly give prizes to the winner. And that's actually one of the main reasons why Chinese wrestling has been kept popularized throughout this period of time. There has been a record of the West Han Dynasty where uh, the government have, hold, have held wrestling competition that has over 300 participants, and at the time that's really pretty big, considering the kind of population they have. And later on, wrestling has been kept within the military as well as uh, among con contenders in contest all the way up to the Tang Dynasty, during which time uh, it has a new name called Xiangpu. And Xiangpu, interestingly, is the Chinese kanji 
of the Japanese name sumo, right? Sumo wrestling. From this, we can pretty much tell that the Japanese concept of sumo wrestler originally came from the Tang Dynasty when they sent a lot of emissaries to to Tang Dynasty to study the Tang culture, right? They are known as Qian Tang Shi. The emissaries that are sent to the Tang Dynasty to learn the the, the Tang culture, the Tang practices, various uh, practices and and uh, red record language, architecture, all of that, and then they brought them back to Japan. Chinese Chinese wrestling, known as Shangpu at the time, was also then taken to the Jap Japanese island. Exactly what Xiangpu looked like during the Tang Dynasty is pretty much lost, but we can pretty much have a vague idea by you know observing what sumo wrestling looks like today. Obviously, when it was passed on to Japan, they naturally evolved it into their own form of sport throughout you know over a thousand years. But we can still see some hints of what the Tang Dynasty sumo wrestling Xiangpu was most likely like because can you some some record? During the Tang Dynasty and quite possibly even Han Dynasty and before that, while wrestling, you know, wrestle is the main aim in this contest, but you are also allowed to strike. Exactly what kind of strike, how to strike, there's no clear record, but it is said that it's allowed to strike. We can see that from today's sumo wrestling, right? They are still allowed to do palm strikes to a person's body, I think the chest mostly, and allowed to use that to either soften the opponent or to push them out of the ring. It's also believed by some scholar, although it's not explicitly clear in the record, that during the Tang Dynasty, uh, wrestling Xiangpu is slowly differentiated from another form of hand-to-hand -hand combat where strike is predominantly used, where it's a scholar called Bai Da. So Bai Da, Bai means white now, and Da means to strike, but during the Tang Dynasty, that would be interpreted as empty hand strike without weaponry. Now, there are some arguments between scholars just exactly what Bai Da is. <clears throat> some believe Bai Da is a form of empty hand striking uh, combat. Others uh, believe that Bai Da refers to a position in the ball game from the Tang Dynasty called Chu Ju. It's almost like soccer, but not exactly the same. It refers to a position that you, you take when you play that ball game in close quarter range. Some even say that in that ball game you're allowed to, to body bump people or maybe strike them, that's why it's called Bai Da. So there are some discrepancies among scholars who studies this topic. But what we do know is that this, this name Bai Da is also passed on to Japan through the Tang emissaries. And in Japan, in their old language, they also refer to striking martial art as Bai Da. So most likely, during the Tang Dynasty, there was another form of combat called Bai Da, where they focused on striking, whereas Xiangpu, right, Sumo in Japanese, uh, is more of a wrestling-based martial art. So some scholars believe that, that the two split as, as early as the Tang Dynasty. But again, like I said, there are not enough records to know exactly what is what. These are all kind of speculation, but are supported by partial text. Then came the Song Dynasty, where Xiangpu is still a predominantly popular way of wrestling, and they are still being kept in the military trainings, as well as having uh, competitions and contests where people would fight for prizes. While as Bai Da, right, the, the striking based martial arts, the, as far as I know, there aren't any record about it during the Song Dynasty, so people aren't really sure if it survived from Tang to Song Dynasty. Now, I'm not saying that nobody uh, struck each other during the Song Dynasty, right? That quite possibly did happen, but there are no records on what that actually means that it is not a big deal. It doesn't become a whole system where a lot of people practice. Because if a lot of people practice that, participate in the context of it, then there most certainly would be records. So the fact that there aren't records does not mean that nobody strike each other. It just means that it's not big enough or influential enough to be recorded. Well, sumo during the Song Dynasty has, has basically become something that they only throw, and striking is pretty much not allowed. Then came the Yuan Dynasty, which is pretty interesting because the Yuan people, the Mongolians, they don't trust the Han people, right? And because, first of all, they are considered as nomad barbarians that took over the Han people, the Chinese who consider themselves more civilized, 
So the Han people naturally don't like the Mongolian ruling over them. And secondly, the Mongolian emperor, except three of them, right? The others cannot speak Chinese or, or the Han language. So they don't even understand what the people they're ruling over is thinking and saying, and therefore they have very little trust towards them, which is why during the Yuan Dynasty, it is banned for any civilian to train any form of combat skill, which naturally include uh, Xiang Pu, which is a song version of wrestling. And if there were any kind of striking martial art, it would also therefore be forbidden. Even the Chinese ethnic military soldiers that were working under the Yuan Dynasty, they were only allowed to handle with wooden weaponry. They were not, not even given metal weapons because the Yuan people distrust them. So the Yuan ruled over China for around 90 years, and that's pretty much is enough time for these practices from the Song Dynasty to almost go extinct. And I say almost because, of course, there are always exceptions. Maybe some people kept it going. We don't actually know for sure. But majority of it is most likely lost because, you see, Chinese people, um, they're not inherently into fighting. Now, while the Yuan Dynasty themselves are very proficient at Mongolian wrestling, but they do not allow the Han people to learn that. So that was most kept among the Mongolians themselves. They have contests all the time. They have award prizes to the winners, but they don't want the Han people to take any form of combat training. Eventually, the Mongols were overthrown by the Ming Dynasty. And the Ming Emperor, they want to revive uh, Chinese wrestling from the Song Dynasty to train their troops. And so while there are many names used during the Ming Dynasty, one of the common ones is called Shou Bo. Shou means hand, and Bo means to fight. So adding the two together is a form of empty hand fighting. And around the same period is when Quan Fa is first recorded in the manuscript. And in today's world, there are quite a lot of people who claim that Chinese martial art or Quan Fa has its origin from Chinese wrestling. Their argument is obviously that because Chinese wrestling has been in China for much longer, right, all the way back during the spring autumn period, whereas Quan Fa only happened during the Ming Dynasty. So naturally, this much older form of hand-to-hand -hand combat must be the forefather of Quan Fa. However, without actual evidence and record to prove this, this logic in itself is not actually correct. For example, we are Homo sapiens, and there's a form of primate much older than us called Neanderthals. Neanderthals has all gone extinct, but they existed before Homo sapiens. However, According to modern DNA study, most of the humans who are Homo sapiens are not related to Neanderthals, right? I mean, there are some individuals where their family seem to eventually be able to trace back to a mix between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, but majority of the humans known as today, Homo sapiens, we are not related to Neanderthals in any way. So while there are two separate primate groups that existed around the same time, and the Neanderthals actually existed before the Homo sapiens, it doesn't actually mean that they must be our forefathers. The two actually existed parallel to each other and independent of one another. Another example we can look at is that in ancient Greek, there's a form of anti-hand combat called pancreation. And according to the to scholars, its rules are very similar to modern MMA. But it does not mean that pancreation is the forefather of modern MMA, because if you know anything about MMA, you know that it was originally started by the Gracie family from Brazil who predominantly did jiu-jitsu and then they were winning a lot of the early no rule contests such as Valetudo and eventually one of the Gracie family went to America and founded the UFC and that's basically when eventually a lot of participants took part together and eventually they worked out this hybrid between striking, standing up fighting and ground fighting and eventually became MMA so from this we can clearly see that MMA has no direct relationship to pancreation from ancient Greek. But by logic, you know, similar rule existed way back in the days and according to these people uh, about, you know, Chinese wrestling being the forefather of, of Chinese Chanfa, then pancreation must be the forefather of MMA. But, you know, we know that's not true, which is why without any solid evidence, you know, i.e. record that says 
you know, this trend file was first found based on wrestling. Therefore, without having provided evidence like that, one can't just simply claim that wrestling is a forefather for Chinese trend file, just simply because it's all older. There are even people uh, on the internet who go as far as taking some of the stances from Chinese wrestling and claim that, oh, look, you see, this looks just like another move in Chinese martial art Quan Fa, and therefore, you know, and because Chinese wrestling is older, therefore they must be the forefather. And let's look at a short clip of one of the YouTubers who makes such claims. Qian Xu Hou Shi, Shuang Shou, Qian Gai Hou Shang, Cheng Yun Shou, Zhuan Dong Yu Ti Qian. 此架流行于京津两地。Because basically in this、uh, video,、uh, he showed sometimes wrestling doing a movement that looks like this, and it looks like yun shou cloud hand in in tai chi. And his argument is that therefore tai chi has its origin in Chinese wrestling. However, what he doesn't know is that this type of motion. In wrestling, actually have its origin in Mongolian wrestling. If you look at the Mongolians, they start when they come onto the ring or the arena, they dance like this. And then they start doing wrestling. And we all know that Mongolian wrestling is what gave birth to the Manchurian wrestling, which is what eventually is one of the biggest source of modern. Chinese wrestling, or Chinese shuaijiao, and that's most likely where this hand motion comes from. And the, and the Mongolians naturally has no tie to Tai Chi, which started in the Qian village. And therefore, referencing my previous video about possibility and equal probability, just because those two actions look similar, it doesn't actually mean、um, you know claw hand came from wrestling instead of coming from Qian family. Martial art, and naturally, if you actually look into Chen family martial art, they have no tie to Mongolian, so this theory simply cannot stand. Which is why, for those of you who are watching my video, whenever you see something similar, don't just naturally draw a conclusion they must be related. You have to actually look at its individual historical development to see if they actually have a point of of, of merging. If there isn't a point of interaction, crossroad or merging, then chances are they just happen to be similar. But has no actual relationship. There are also people who make the argument that in the Ming Dynasty, Quan Fa, right, the first method, is actually the same as Shou Bo, which is the Ming Dynasty wrestling. But we can pretty much say with certainty that this isn't true because by studying manuscripts such as Ji Xiao Xin Shu from General Qi Ji Guang, we can clearly see that when he refers to Quan Fa, he isn't referring to wrestling. We already know during the Ming Dynasty that you know Shou Bo or the Chinese wrestling at the time had been practiced by the Chinese military. So when he was talking about Quan Fa in his manuscript, he's clearly not referring to the Ming military wrestling. And there's nothing that suggests Quan Fa is another name for the Ming Dynasty's version of wrestling. And from this, we can see that during General Qi Ji Guang's era. There are already two completely independent systems of hand-to-hand -hand combat. One is the Ming military wrestling. One is what General Qi Guang referred to as Quan Fa. And based on his manuscript, majority of that information and technique and training came from civilian-based martial artists. So we can pretty much be sure that when he referred to Quan Fa in his text, he's referring to a group of empty-hand martial arts that was. Practiced by the civilians of Ming Dynasty, rather than Shou Bo or any other form of Chinese wrestling practiced by the military. We can also see from General Qi's own、uh, Quan Fa posture that it looks nothing like wrestling. Now, of course, I'm not saying that there are no throwing technique was in his、uh, own military、uh, Quan Fa posture, but you can see the majority of it. Evolves around striking and kicking with some locking and some throwing, which is pretty much, in summary, the foundational concept of any Quan Fa in general. An interesting thing here to note, right, is that some、uh, wrestling enthusiasts claim that because in General Qi's manuscript he explicitly said that Quan Fa has no major usage 
in large-scale warfare. While on the other hand, we all know that a form of Chinese wrestling has been practiced throughout the ages in military, and therefore, wrestling must be more useful than Quan Fa when it comes to large-scale, olden-day warfare. Now, this is actually highly debatable, but it is quite a complex topic, so we'll be covering this in a separate video. So from this, we can pretty much say that the origin of Quan Fa, or the first, the first method, existed independently to the Ming Dynasty wrestling, Shoubo, or whatever else they were calling it at the time. So the one did not come from the other, they were developed independent of each other. Like I've mentioned in my previous video, any Chinese martial system that end with something something Quan, and later on something something Zhang, and even some that are not named Quan or Zhang, such as Chuo Jiao, or Tan Tui, etc. All of these can be traced back to Quan Fa during the late Ming Dynasty. And from there you can clearly see that wrestling and Quan Fa, they are not really related. They, uh, they might be some areas of merging, you know, some maybe trends this and trends that, but overall, they are two separate systems. And during the Qing Dynasty, the Manchurians were very big fans of wrestling. They actually learned wrestling from the Mongolians, and eventually developed their own version of Mongolian wrestling. And they even set a special military camp near Beijing called Shan Puying, where in it are their own Manchurian who are expert at Manchurian wrestling. It's believed that some of the civilians uh, around Beijing also practiced wrestling at the time, but this is, again it isn't very clearly re recorded because as far as we know, majority of the Manchurian wrestling were kept among the Manchurians within the uh, wrestling camps. As the Manchurian government started to decline towards the late Qing dynasty, eventually um, they no longer had enough money to keep these professional Manchurian wrestlers, and that's believed most likely when majority of the Manchurian wrestling were then passed down into the civilian society, and eventually became what we know today as Chinese wrestling. So our version of wrestling that we see today is not a direct product from the Ming Dynasty, but from the Qing Dynasty. So while the Ming Dynasty had their own form of wrestling, but the Qing government brought another form of wrestling from the Mongolians and modified by their own Manchurian people. So they're actually not related to the Ming Dynasty's wrestling. Of course, they most likely have merges and skill sharings and cross trainings. For example, it's commonly believed that the uh, Wrestling they practice in Tianjin, right? It's one of the cities near. It's a port city near Beijing. They believe that the wrestling practice in Tianjin is a mix between Manchurian wrestling and the Ming Dynasty's wrestling. Although I'm not sure exactly how true it is, because if you compare it to the Beijing wrestling, which is pure Manchurian wrestling, you can see that majority of the stuff is the same. There's no huge difference between the two. I mean, there are obviously habit difference, slightly different in technique, but majority of the stuff is pretty much the same. And we're talking about wrestling, there's another lineage of wrestling from Baoding. It's another small county uh, close to Beijing. So there are basically three main systems of Chinese wrestling to today, right? Whereas Beijing, which is the uh, authentic Manchurian wrestling, there's the Tianjin, which is Manchurian, supposedly merged with Ming Dynasty wrestling, and then there is Baoding. They do a form of speed wrestling or fast re re wrestle, where they supposedly learned it from the Chinese Muslim or what we call Hui Min. Exactly where these Hui Min learned their form of wrestling, uh, it is unclear. But they, a, a group of them, settled around Baoding and then taught eventually they practice among themselves because the, the Hui Min, the Chinese Muslim, uh, they have always been bullied by other races, uh, ethnic groups which was they are pretty big on training martial arts, but eventually uh, they passed it on to Han people as well in Baoding County. Another interesting about the Baoding branch is that you know in their wrestling, they are allowed to strike. So some people use that as an argument to say that you know Quan Fa, you know, first method is not the correct classification because in wrestling you can also strike. However, as you should already know by now that this 
differentiation is from the source of origin. The Baodin wrestling, this origin is not the same as this Chinese traditional martial arts system that came from Quanfa of the late Ming Dynasty. So they don't have the same origin. That is the biggest and the most important differentiation. And furthermore, even though in Baodin wrestling, there are some strikes implemented, when you actually go to a wrestling match, you are still not allowed to strike. So what, you know, maybe in the self-defense version, they teach some striking and then wrestling. But in the contest, they can only wrestle, they are not allowed to strike. Which means, fundamentally, Baoding wrestling is still more wrestling and throwing based than the striking based systems that is, can be classified as Quanfa. And more importantly, the Baoding wrestling has a completely different origin to what we classify as Quanfa historically. Now, this is not to say the old Quanfa has one single origin, okay? That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. However, Quanfa, we're unclear of exactly where it originated exactly, but we all know that at some point, you know, Qi Ji Guang and others grouped these, you know, training system that are kind of similar together and classified them as Quanfa. Whereas Baoding wrestling is something that evolved on its own, completely separated from this group classification of Quanfa. And therefore, historically, you can't, you know, consider them to be the same thing, even though Baoding wrestling does have some a degree of striking. If it indeed it's the same as Quanfa, then back in those days, you know, it, it wouldn't be eventually called Baoding Shui Jiao, right? Baoding Kuai Jiao, or whatever the name they want to call it, it would just be called Baoding Quan. But that's clearly not the case. And just, you know, and language is very important when it comes to understand the separation because it directly reflects the understanding of the people who created, trained, and passed on these skills. And again, this is not to say that any of the Quanfa practitioners do not cross train in Chinese wrestling. For example, second generation Bagua master Chen Tinghua, before he learned Bagua from his father Dong Hai Chuan, he was first a Chinese wrestling practitioner. And later on, he learned Bagua from Dong Hai Chuan and quite possibly uh, put his wrestling skill into Bagua and a lot of his the disciples are proficient both in Bagua and in wrestling. So I'm not saying that people who train Quanfa doesn't train wrestling, right? That's not what I'm saying. But the two has been seen as two different systems. They're not the same system. Which is why, going back to our initial question, if by Chinese martial art or Chinese tra traditional martial art, you're referring to Quanfa, then Chinese Shui Jiao is not actually considered to be part of it. It's something else on the side. Now, later on, we come to Republic era, and during which time, Chinese wrestling's position has been greatly elevated. It's becoming part of the, an important subject to be studied in the, in the Nanjing Central Guoshu Academy. So if you're at the Republic era, or maybe if you're in Taiwan today, because they still kept the Republic era's uh, you know, mentality and tradition, if you ask them, is Chinese wrestling part of Guoshu? Then naturally the answer is yes, because Wrestling is a very important subject to be practiced by all students from the Nanjing Central Guoshu Academy. However, the counter argument would be that boxing was also a subject that students in the Nanjing Guoshu Academy had to practice. Now, does that mean boxing is also Chinese martial art? Obviously, the answer is no, which is why we can see that from this uh, you know, perspective, it's not very correct. So from this we can see that just because Chinese wrestling is part of the Nanjing Guoshu Academy's courses, it, it shouldn't naturally qualify it to be part of Chinese traditional martial art. Of course, it's part of Guoshu, right? But Guoshu just means the technique, method, or art of a nation, of, of national practice. So yeah, Chinese wrestling is part of a national practice. But it doesn't mean that it's part of Wushu or it's part of Quanfa, which later on be translated to Chinese traditional martial art. And this is possibly the source of the confusion because a lot of the Nanjing Guoshu Academy people, uh, after the Kuomintang lost the war, they fled to Taiwan and they are the first one to, brought, to bring Chinese wrestling to the West, to America, to Europe, and, and etc. And naturally, they consider them to be part of the same because when they went to the, the Guoshu Academy, they were taught 
wrestling uh, Quan Fa, even boxing together. So naturally, they believe that it's part of the same thing. And that's quite possibly where a lot of Westerners got this idea from that Chinese wrestling is part of uh, Chinese traditional martial art. But we, we need to understand that this was not true during the Qing Dynasty, and it's no longer true during the People's Republic era. It was only true during the Republic of China era and the government that consequently fled to Taiwan, which kept that same mentality and tradition. Now, after the People's Republic of China was formed, they once again split up between Quan Fa and wrestling. And we can know this by simply looking at the, the Chinese National Sport Institute and how they offer Wushu as a subject and Shui Jiao as a separate subject. Now, before any of you start saying that Wushu refers to contemporary martial art, which is not even combat appropriate, you have to remember that originally there was no contemporary Chinese martial art. Wushu was simply the name that they decided to adopt to refer to Quan Fa because they don't want to use the name Guo Shu from Central Academy because that's from the Kuomintang era. They need to be done away with that history and form their own history, which is why they chose the name Wushu. And when they chose the name Wushu, they did not choose to include Shui Jiao. Shui Jiao became a separate subject. We can say that the term Wushu is a modern replacement for the term Quan Fa rather than a replacement for the term Guo Shu, and thus does not include Shui Jiao. And later on, the Wushu subject in the university it actually originated as a traditional Chinese martial arts subject, but as it started to develop, they started to go more and more flashy, and eventually it became what we know today as contemporary Chinese martial arts or contemporary Wushu. You know, I've spoken this with some of the first generation members of Shidahai Sport Academy, right? Who were the original members of the Beijing Wushu team. You know, they told me that during those days, they were actually learning traditional martial arts from traditional master, whether it's Xing Yi or Ba Gua or whatnot. And later on, then they were asked to make a more performance ready, and eventually that eventually became contemporary Wushu. So when the Chinese government first established the term Wushu, it wasn't used to describe contemporary only. It was used to describe any martial arts system that is part of Quan Fa. And from this, we can see that during the People's Republic era, Quan Fa, known as Wushu, and Shui Jiao are not the same. And because the government split them into two, the Chinese wrestling practitioners, the athletes, they don't consider themselves as part of Wushu either. And they see themselves as something on their own, and unrelated to Wushu. So if you were to ask any Chinese wrestler from those periods, they will basically tell you that, you know, we are not Wushu, we are Shui Jiao, it's not the same thing at all. Their attitude started to change after 1992, where the government decided to remove Shui Jiao from its national sport system, meaning that you can no longer be, there's no longer a Shui Jiao national team, no longer a Shui Jiao provincial team, you can no longer do Shui Jiao and be paid by the government as a professional sport athlete. Shui Jiao was also taken away from all Asian games. So all of a sudden, the Shui Jiao practitioners are no longer favored by the government. And after that, some of them slowly wanted to be part of Chinese traditional martial arts again because before that, they considered themselves as part of the Chinese official government instated sports system. The only ones equal to them are the contemporary Wushu athletes. They look down on the traditional martial practitioners because they can't get paid by the government to do Chinese traditional martial arts. So they see themselves as, a, as in a higher position. But after 1992, they lost that position and you can only be a you know, civilian-based Chinese wrestler. You can no longer be part of the government's professional team. And after that, uh, some of them starting to want to come back and be part of the Chinese traditional martial art community. But the Chinese traditional martial art people, you know, obviously some of them probably don't mind, but majority of them don't really see them as part of the same system because they have been separated since the founding of People's Republic of China. So they don't see a reason why all of a sudden they want to be part of it. So this pretty much lasted until present day, right? If you ask some of the Chinese wrestlers in Beijing, for example, they will say, yeah, they are part of traditional martial art. They're part of Chuan Wu. That's what they call Chinese traditional martial art now. Chuan Tong Wu Shu, right, the short for Chuan Wu. But if you ask 
anyone doing any form of you know Chan Fa, then they will say no, Chinese dressing is not part of, of us. You know, we have always been separated. So there's some kind of argument going on, but you know, if you were to follow this whole historical development, you can clearly see that originally these two are completely separate and not really related. Next, let's look at what some of the experts say about this topic. So first, we're going to talk about one of the most famous Chinese wrestlers still alive today in Beijing called Li Baoru. Right, if you don't know who he is, just Google him. He's very, very famous in the Chinese Shui Jiao community. He's considered you know, the most authoritative person alive today in Chinese wrestling community in China. And when asked whether or not Chinese Shui Jiao is the same as Zhongguo Chuantong Wu Shu, right, Chinese traditional martial arts, his answer is that those two are not the same. And his viewpoint is that Shui Jiao has been kept as a trainer or a coach to athlete or student kind of system. For example, in the Qing Dynasty, you have the head trainer of Shan Puying, right? The military, um, the Qing Dynasty's wrestling camp, and they train students. Whereas Chinese martial arts have more of a father to son relationship. In Chinese wrestling, there is no style or system. You don't become a disciple of a, you know, a, a wrestling master. You are simply his student. Whereas in Chinese martial arts, you have to knee down, bow down, and become tu di, which is basically a disciple son. And the relationship is a father to son. You basically join the style, you have to be loyal to the style, and you have to treat your master like your father, instead of a student to teach a relationship. So for him, that's the fundamental difference between the two, and therefore, he does not believe that Shui Jiao is the same as Zhongguo Chuantong Wu Shu or Chinese traditional martial arts. Another person that we can reference is someone known as Mei Hui Zhi. Right? He is considered the founding father of Chinese Sanda. Obviously, he isn't the one who really invented Sanda, but he's one of the forefathers that paved his way to what we see as modern Sanda. And before he became a Sanda coach, he first trained uh, freestyle wrestling, and then he trained Chinese wrestling in Shi Shizhahai, uh, the Beijing's most prestigious sport academy. So he has been known to speak out against Chinese traditional martial art back in the day. See, whenever a reporter asks, he will say that Chinese traditional martial art is mostly legend and story and it cannot fight. And it's no match for modern combat sports such as Sanda. And here's a little interview of him talking on this topic.这个散打搏击包括中国式摔跤国际式摔跤它都是以西方体育这个理念啊构成现在的竞技比赛你作为这个中国传统式的这个口传新授的这种训练方法已经跟现在的这个竞技体育差的距离很大了 the translation of that video is somewhat lacking, right? So what, what basically Mei Hui Zhi was trying to say there is that Chinese traditional martial art is inefficient in combat compared to Sanda, and therefore to him those two are separated. And to him, Sanda, one of the fundamental building blocks is Chinese strategy and freestyle wrestling. And so therefore, in his mind, Chinese traditional martial arts is excluded from the proper efficient combat training, which includes Chinese strategy, and therefore the two are separate. Now, of course, what he's trying to say here is to differentiate the two from the efficiency in combat and the method of training. Whereas up to now, we've been more focusing on the cultural and historical differences. However, the point of showing this video is to show you the mindset of Chinese wrestling practitioners in China, which he can clearly represent, and how they, despite the reason, they don't see Chinese Shui Jiao as part of Chinese traditional martial art. And in his mindset, as well as most others in his position, when we're talking about Chinese traditional martial art 
they're referring to the civilian-based people who still practice Chinese martial art today, whereas they represent the official governmental instated sports system, and therefore they are not the same. Now, of course, they are still civilian-based Chinese tradial practitioners, even more so after that they fell from grace in the 90s. But due to decades of separation between Shuai Jiao and Chinese traditional martial arts, before Shuai Jiao was excluded from the national sports system, the separation is still very strong in most people's mind. Both the Shuai Jiao crowd and the Chinese traditional civilian martial art crowd they do not accept each other and think they are one and the same. And obviously, you know, up to now you should know, historically speaking, they are not from the same source or the same classification. It's only in more recent years that some Shuai people have started to try to include themselves as part of Chuan Wu, right? short for Chuan Wu Shu, traditional martial arts. Because like I said earlier, because they're not included in the national system anymore. But at the same time, they are still alienating everyone else from the traditional martial arts scene by claiming that Chinese wrestling is the only efficient combat system out of all the Chinese traditional martial art practices. Obviously, this video isn't here to discuss or debate which one is more efficient. This is just to lay the background for you to understand why in the after People's Republic of China was formed, there's a very strong separation between Wu Shu, traditional Chinese martial art, and Shuai Jiao. Now, of course, one could argue that this separation only exists in mainland China and it's not true in Taiwan and overseas, especially those that are brought overseas by the Taiwanese practitioners. However, as I've already discussed earlier in, in the video, Shuai Jiao and Quan Fa was never considered as the same group of, of classification since their origin. And it was only put together into one during the Republic era and labeled as Guo Shu. So if Chinese traditional martial arts is a direct translation from the term Wu Shu, then Shuai Jiao is not part of it because the term Wu Shu used to describe Chinese martial art was popularized by People's Republic of China's government. When, once they took over China, that's where this term Wu Shu started to be popularized. And therefore, when using this term, you had to kind of had to follow the definition set by the people who started using this term to describe Chinese martial art. But more importantly, as I've been stating over and over, we need to respect the origin and the historical development, and from there we can clearly see that the two are not related and were considered separate during the Ming Dynasty. Next, let's look at uh, the separation from a language perspective. Now, why is language important? Because anything you can understand from a culture from a society, from what they understand, you can understand that through their language. Without language, uh, we cannot communicate and, there, and therefore cannot preserve any cultural understanding. So language is a very important indicator when it comes to this type of understanding and study. And besides the obvious fact that Quan Fa and Shuai Jiao or Shou Bo, whatever else you want to call it, they are two completely different descriptions in the Chinese language. Furthermore, there are many proverbs that can also support this point. For example, there's a very famous saying in the, Chinese, in the Chinese martial community that says, 三年的把式, 当年的教. So 把式 is basically an older way of calling Chinese traditional martial art. 把式 basically means posture, because back in the days, you know, a martial arts system consists of, you know, 32 postures, 36 postures, etc, etc. Which is why, especially in Changzhou area, they used to, re to refer to Chinese martial arts quan fa also as ba shi. So, san nian de ba shi, dang nian de jiao. What this saying means is that you need at least three years to be efficient in quan fa, or ba shi, striking martial arts training but you don't need one year to be good at Chinese wrestling. So this proverb is actually saying that Chinese wrestling is more efficient in a shorter period of time than Chinese traditional martial art. And further, we can see that there's a differentiation between the two. Ba Shi Quan Fa is considered on one end that requires three years, and Shui Jiao is considered something else that requires only one year. Another proverb that goes, Ba Shi Jia Jiao, Yue Lian Yue Gao, again, 
refers to Chinese traditional martial arts. Jiao refers to Chinese wrestling. Ba shi jia jiao means if you combine Quan Fa and Chinese wrestling, yue lian yue gao means the more you practice, the better you get. So this proverb is basically saying that once you merge Quan Fa and wrestling to become better. Again, from here you can see that the two in the language are considered to be two different things. If they are considered part of the same thing, then this, then this saying cannot exist. So just in case you're not familiar with the term Ba Shi, let's break it up a little. Ba is an older way of referring to Chinese martial art techniques. While most styles today don't use this term anymore, but some of the older styles can still find this kind of description. For example, in Xin Yi Liu He Quan, Xin Yi Ba, as well as Xin Yi consequentially because it came from Xin Yi, that a lot of the move, you know, they still call it something something Ba. While Shi, on the other hand, refers to posture, for example, General Qi Yiguang's 32 posture, or the famous Tai Ji 13 posture, Tai Ji 13 Shi. So adding the term Ba and Shi together is a, one of the more primitive way of describing Chinese traditional martial arts, especially popular among uneducated people. If you go to rural areas, they, they sometimes, you know, back in the days, and sometimes even today, they still refer to Chinese martial arts as Ba Shi. But you know, ever since Chinese martial arts has moved up in the social ladder to more civilized people, you know, they naturally prefer a more elegant description, which is basically Quan Fa, Quan Shu, and then in modern day Wu Shu. Now, back in the days, for example, in Changzhou province, a martial art training facility is called Ba Shi Fang, where Fang means room. So that's what they called back in the days instead of a martial art school or Quan Guan. So from this, you can see that Ba Shi was commonly used to describe Chinese traditional martial arts, and it also does not include Shui Jiao, because otherwise that whole saying of Ba Shi Jia Jiao could not exist, because if they are two of the, if they are actually the same thing, then they can't be separated in language. And in, in a more modern era, uh, a lot of people have already replaced the term Ba Shi with Wu Shu, and those saying can still be applied, when you, instead of saying Ba Shi, you can still say Wu Shu Jia Jiao Yue Lian Yue Gao, or so the, so the saying still works if you replace Ba Shi with Wu Shu. Another evidence to show that Ba Shi was an older way of describing Quan Fa, which we are now replacing with Wu Shu. And from the same language usage, we can see that Wu Shu does not include Shui Jiao, otherwise this way of describing things will not make sense, because you know, if they're the same, then you can't say Wu Shu Jia Jiao, you can't add this and that if they're actually the same thing. So this, is, so this just shows you that from a cultural and language perspective, the Chinese people also does, does not consider Wu Shu and Shui Jiao to be the same thing. Furthermore, if I you know, were in China and I tell somebody, Wu Lian Quan, it means I train first. No one would, would expect you to be referring to wrestling. So fundamentally in our language, right, deep in our language system, the two is considered to be separate. When I go train Chinese martial art or even boxing, I will say 我去打拳 Da means to strike Or I can say 我去练拳 Lian means to practice 我打拳练拳 But when I say I'm going to go train Chinese wrestling, I use completely different language So in Beijing, we either say 我去练教 Or we mean I'm going to train wrestling Or I say 我去聊个教 They can all refer to wrestling And you can see that it all refers to 教 as wrestling and not Quan as in Quan Fa. So in case any of you are wondering, now what if I don't say first, I don't say 我练拳或者我打拳, instead I said uh, 我练武或者我习武, right? I practice 武, or I, I'm learning 武, 武 here means martial, so it's a short for martial skill. Well, majority of people in China will still think you are referring to Chinese traditional martial art, which is 武术, right? 武 is a short for Wu Shu. So Wu Lian Wu is just a short way of saying Wu Lian Wu Shu or Wu Xi Wu, which is basically I'm studying Wu Shu. And that still does not include Shui Jiao in most people's perspective. And again, just to clarify that I'm not saying that Shui Jiao is not a martial skill or is not a type of martial training coming from China. I'm just trying to point out that from the habit of a language, you can clearly see that Wu Shu. Quan Fa, traditional martial art, is separated from the term we use to describe wrestling, which is Shui Jiao. Which is why, if you speak the actual language of Chinese and you actually spend time in China, you will find it quite strange why some of the Western people would think 
Chinese wrestling and Chinese martial arts are one of the same. Uh, of course, the Biniaf explains that given the context, uh, that they don't know where Chinese martial arts are supposed to just refer to Wushu, then it makes sense. But if you, strictly speaking, see Chinese martial art referring to the different styles of Chinese martial art which comes to get as Wushu or as Quan Fa, then Shui Jiao exists individually on its own and is not considered part of the same system. Next, we are going to look at a more practical analysis to see the similarities and difference between Quan Fa and Shui Jiao.